Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And for this week's roundtable podcast, we have Jeannie, feeling better, Morum. Jeannie, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for asking. Great, great. Jeannie's been a little under the weather and uh, finally got a good diagnosis. So great to have Jeannie back. And then, of course, we've got, I love it when you call me Big Papa, Tate Litchfield, the Big Papa. How are you, Tate? I'm good. Happy to be on the call this week. It never gets old for me, by the way. I don't think it gets old for anyone. Maybe Scott Todd, but <laughs> everyone else, I think they like it. They like it when you they sing. Like I, 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 I think I came up with that title, didn't I? You might have said it. But I yeah. Think I said that's what we were going to start calling them. Yeah, yeah, but only I know Biggie Smalls, I think. Within well, the, now, the round table. now I walk around, like my wife and I will go on walks, and I'm out there rapping, you know, like I like it when you call me Big Papa, and she's looking at me like I'm crazy. She's like, Shh, be quiet, be quiet. I'm like, blare <laughs> this song, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, in June, uh, Tate, Kanye is dropping another album. I saw that, yeah. Are we going to go yeah. this time? To see Kanye? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Yeah. Bucket list. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and then, of course, we got the Six Sigma, Scott Todd, scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And, of course, if you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek, Scott Todd. How are things? Mark, they're great. How are you? Good, good. It's just the four of us today on the roundtable. So this will be interesting. It'll be fun. Um, I think as a first sort of topic, we should discuss Mimi Schmidt, our newest coach, and what that was like um, having Mimi come out on Nightcap last week and discuss her journey. So, Jeannie, let's start with you. What was it like listening to Mimi? What were your, some of your takeaways? Well, I, I really enjoyed the interview because – um, the gentleman asked her some great questions and it really opened her up. And she said, um, there was a couple things that I really enjoyed that um, you give her a lot of hope and, and boot camp. She's been to a lot of boot camps. She's been doing this for about three years and something that you told her early on that this could take two or three years to do. This is not a, um, a sprint. It's a marathon. And I really enjoyed hearing that because as you mentioned earlier, you know, I haven't been feeling very well, and I was diagnosed with valley fever, but I've been sick for months. And I've been really beating myself up about not going quicker or faster with Lang Geek, and I enjoy it. But listening to her, she said, you got to go at your own pace and don't beat yourself up. And I really feel that's important for our listeners to understand that because, again, something else Tate said after he came back from vacation, there's no such thing as a land emergency. And I really appreciated that because that helped me relax a little bit. It made me realize, yeah, let's just, we buy it and then we sell it, you know? And I also appreciate what, what Scott says too. It's all about mailing and marketing. And you guys keep repeating that over and over and over and you make it simple and, and, and profitable for us. And um, so, and also she got started by listening to podcasts. So I'd also really, I think that's important too, because that's how I found out about you, Mark. And I really encourage our listening audience to listen to the podcast, listen to Nightcap, because you get a lot of information from these podcasts that don't cost you anything. Valuable information. No, a absolutely. And it reminds me of uh, two of my, my favorite quotes. Um, the first is from Zig Ziglar. If you'll do for the next three to five years what other people won't do, you'll be able to do for the rest of your life what other people can't do. And, you know, three to five years to have financial freedom in the big scheme of things, not so bad, right? Um, but often what happens is, um, and this is the other favorite quote of mine from Tony Robbins, is we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what we can accomplish in five. And so being able to, you know, sort of extend that time horizon extend out those expectations and embrace the suck, um, I think really helped Mimi sort of be the, 
the tortoise and not the hare and get to where she wanted to be. Um, and look, let's face it. She hunts terrorists all day long. She manages 150 people. She's got three kids, you know, husband, she's got a big life. And for her to take on another thing was especially difficult, especially complex. And yet here she is um, doing it. Uh, Scott. Yeah. You know, go ahead, Jeannie. I'm sorry. She, you're right. She said slow and steady, but she also said now, if I have this correct, that she's going to quit her job. Yeah, she is going to quit her job, which was the ultimate goal, I think, for her um, in, in, the, in the beginning because she wasn't spending enough time with her family. It was just, you know, it's a, you know, it's a taxing job. She's, it's kind of like what I said to Mike Zeno. I'm like, look, you've paid your dues. You've saved enough lives. Like, why keep taking all this risk? And so if we sort of substitute risk for stress for Mimi, she's sort of in that same boat. Um, Scott, Todd, what do you know, how, how do you sort of manage expectations? You know, like Tate and I might haze you. We might have the same kind of property in, in the same area. And, you know, it takes you two weeks longer to sell it, right? Or, or whatever it is. Um, how, how do you manage your expectations about, you know, what is, what it is to achieve your goals? Well, I think first you have to, you have to understand like, you know, that, that any time horizon is artificially set, right? We set our own time horizons. And as Jeannie said, there's no, there's no one standing over you saying like, you have to do this in two years. Otherwise you have to quit. Like there's nobody putting pressure on you, but you, like you are the, you're the only one that gave yourself that deadline. And while we want to achieve the goals that we set, the reality is, is that if you don't achieve it, it's okay. I think the most important thing is one, having a goal that you're working towards and two, you know, like working smartly so that you can achieve what you want to achieve. But essentially at the end of the day, if, if I fall short, it's okay because I'm moving the needle in my life. I'm beginning to move the needle to where I want to. And, you know, I think Mimi's right. Mimi, uh, you know, the thing about Mimi is that she, she did take a long-term perspective on this. And, you know, another person right now, right now that's taking a long-term perspective, of this is Matt Forbes. Matt, Matt's like, okay, one down, one month down. I forgot whether it's two two years or three years, you know, another 35 to go. And that's okay, right? Like it's okay to give yourself that time horizon. There's no one standing over you saying, get this done or otherwise you can never buy land again. No, absolutely. Tate, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and, and, with respect to what Scott was saying, one of the biggest areas that people tend to stress themselves out in this business is they'll buy a piece of property and they'll say, the timer starts today. If I don't sell this land within 30 days or 45 days, then I'm just going to wholesale it, and move on to the next property. And the reality of it is we can't force anyone to buy our property. So setting that artificial deadline is something out of your control. I've gone several, you know, I've had weeks where we didn't sell anything. And then the next week rolls around and you sell all of your inventory, right? So you can't really determine when people are going to buy. And, and by setting those deadlines on yourself, I think you stress yourself out. You prevent yourself from really growing because you're in a constant state of panic. And that's something that Mimi has avoided, right? She said, I'm going to sell this land when I find the right person for it. And when I find that right person, they're going to pay me X amount. And that's one of the things I really respect about her is, you know, she's got her head on straight and she understands that I can't force anyone to buy what I'm selling, but I can control the marketing. I can control how many people see my properties. And that's why she's been successful. Yeah. I love her grit. The fact that, you know, she would keep getting knocked down, get back up knock down, get back up, um, go to a boot camp, get re-energized. And at boot camp, if you watch Mimi, she's really taking that weekend to work on her business because it, it's sort of a forced boundary for her because if she were home, she's got so much going on, it'd be hard for her to focus. So she comes to all the boot camps simply just to do the work. I mean, she's heard all my jokes. She's heard Scott's jokes and, you know, probably sick of them by now, maybe not but probably, right? But she takes her time and, and, and just moves the needle a little bit every single boot camp and takes that, that time. And um, I think that's been sort of a, a, a critical piece of her success that probably gets overlooked 
um, just forcing it doesn't have to be as extreme as traveling across the country to go to boot camp, but doing something relatively extreme, holding yourself up for a extended period of time to work on your business. However, however that may be. Um, Jeannie, what are your thoughts? I agree. And I, I think if by setting the, those expectations, it's going to help people be successful because in our culture, it's, it's, we want to go fast. And we want to have immediate gratification. But the more we hear about people going slow and steady, we're going to find more success. And, and I think this is why your podcast is so important because it really encourages people to keep moving forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, and from day one, even in our, you know, the beginning of our, our web class, we tell people right away, if you are looking for get rich quick, you are on the wrong web class. This is a get rich slow model. And if someone's sort of in real estate promising you, you know, fast, immediate results, um, they're being disingenuous because the reality is there's only a few things you can control in this business, which is going to be your mailing and your marketing. What the market does with it is really out of, out of anyone's control. Um, and like what Tate was saying, there's no reason to freak out if you haven't sold a property in 30 days. You just need to change something. Maybe you need to lower the down payment. Maybe you need to raise the price. Maybe you need to lower the price. Maybe you need to change your title. Who knows? But something needs to change. It doesn't necessarily mean, well, it's a crap property. Nobody wants it. Let's just wholesale it out and, um, and go to the next one. Right? Tate, what do you think? No, I couldn't agree more with you. I, I think that that's uh, very well said. And yeah, some things are just out of our control. But if you keep at it, I've said it time and time again, this is an if then statement kind of business. If you do this, then that, then this will follow. If you mail, then you will buy land. If you market, then you will sell land. But if you don't do anything, then nothing is going to happen. It all starts right. with you and your actions. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's, let's see if we can pick Scott Todd's geeky genius brain. So Scott, one of my, one of my favorite shows recently has been, <laughs> hack my life and they'll do like these crazy sort of, you know, DIY projects and hack their lives and, and make things better. And, you know, just crazy things like don't have any candles, light a crayon. It can act as a candle. And it like works. And they show all these things. How would you, from a mindset perspective, hack someone's expectations? Ooh, that's good. Oh man. Jeez, that's a yeah, that's like wow. that's a curveball right there. You're just a bat on. <laughs> All right, no, so notice that Je notice that it didn't ask Jeannie or Tate. No, I'm good with that. I'm Look, I'm listening. I would I would say that like I was thinking about this today. Um, you you and I were doing a podcast earlier today, and we were talking about we were you know I forgot exactly what we were talking about, but I started thinking about like when I was working in my job. And like how I kept myself motivated, right? Like how, because that daily grind is brutal. I, I mean, I know it, I still remember it. Like, you know, the, the fact that you're trying to, to do your job, you're, the fact that you're trying to support your family, the fact that you're trying to do quality time with your family, and then you're trying to scale something so that you can achieve the freedom that you want, it's brutal. And I was thinking about, like my routine back in the day, I remember like every day I was going to actually go try to find the book today. Like my notebook, I had a notebook and I wrote down every, every morning I wrote down the five big goals that were important to me and they didn't have a time frame on it, which I know a lot of people like to put down time frames. You know, I will replace my income in 12 months. I will, to me, it's not about the time frame. You make the goal big enough and you start working toward it you will take that little goal that you had and it will just like get consumed. And so I wrote down the big five goals that I wanted and I wrote them down every morning and every night before I went to bed. So I, I remember sitting in my office, I'd break out this notebook, I'd start writing down my five goals. And then what I did was I would write down at the end of the night, at the end of the day, I would write down the five things. And I, I couldn't always think of five things but I would write down the five successes that I had. And then I would write down my five goals again. And so every day I was trying to write down 15 things, five goals in the morning, 
five goals in the afternoon or in the evening, I would close the day with the five successes that I had. And some of these, sometimes you were like stretching for a success. It wasn't like, hey, I made a sale. I made five sales. I can go find that in the book where I made five sales. But you know what? Like if I just did something, something towards my business, something towards my goals, I don't care how small it was. It was a success or I would judge it as a success. And sometimes I wrote down three. Sometimes I wrote down two. My goal was to do five. And I think that that's how you hack it. I think that what you do is you, you come up with the big things, the, the big goals that you're trying to achieve. And then every day you got to figure out what did I do today that I should pat myself on the back for? I don't care if it's just like I added a name to my buyer's list. That's a success. You know, look today, look, Mark, you and I, like if I add one name to my buyer's list, I would price, I would say that's a failure for the day but it would still be a success because it was better than yesterday. Yesterday I had, you know, like what? 7,000 people today. I got 7,001 or whatever the numbers are. Even what you would judge as not a success is still a success. It's moving forward. No, it's so true. I, I mean, I remember developing geek pay and I thought, well, you know, I, I had no expectation for it. I thought, well, this is just a long-term project. And mentally I thought, well, It'll do what it does. And today we're at over a thousand users, which if you told me, you know, it would take three years to get to a thousand users. I don't know what my answer would have been if that was good, if that was bad, but today I'm really proud of it. Right. It's, it's a platform that works. It works well for us. It works well for my clients and maybe one day it'll, it'll work well for other vertical niches that want to automate payments. But I think it would have been, I remember that actually, I remember complaining to everybody about how hard it was and how I wanted to quit and how, you know, whoever starts a SaaS product is crazy. It's the worst business model ever. And, and now I'm, you know, I'm at the other side of it and it's more at peace with it. So, you know, I kind of get that whole, you know, uh, expectation of why is this taking so long? Why is this so hard? And, and, um, and then getting to the other end of it and just being proud <laughs> that, you know what, I'm working towards a big goal that's bigger than myself that hopefully is going to outlive me and really make an impact on the world. And, and that's enough. I think that's enough. What do you think, Jeannie? I love that model. I love Scott's idea because as, as Scott was talking, I think about where I was last year at this time. And last year at this time, I never even ever thought about owning a piece of property. And now... I've bought property. I have sold property. I'm on this podcast. So I love that idea. And I think that's how you can even push yourself even further and faster by doing Scott's model. Love it. Yeah. And then it even helps to have a Tate in your corner that's, yeah. <laughs> that says, you know what, you will do it. Otherwise you got to face me. Right? <laughs> hey, that's, that's sort of the value of coaching just in and of itself is having that other person keep you accountable. Or, or on flight school, crazy guy yelling at you, it's time to mail now. Mail. Well, yeah. Push flight the school. button. We, we make you do yeah, it. Yeah, but having, that, having another person in the same position as you are, somebody who cares about your success and wants to see it, that's, that's motivating, right? That's something that, I don't know, if more people had that in their daily lives, I think they'd, they'd go further in life. They'd get more done. They'd feel better about themselves. But, you know, that's one thing that I can say that I try to do with all the people that I get the pleasure of working with is I care about them genuinely. And if they're not going to do what, they're, what they tell me they're going to do, then we're not going to work together. Right? You know, that is the key to Lane Geek because, Mark, all these people that you surround yourself with and these coaches – really care about people and it's coming through through the podcast through boot camps i mean you you've done a very good job at finding genuine people that really care about people no it's i i'm really blessed in that way and you know when i do my little gratitude journal every morning um inevitably i'm writing down you know scott tate danielle mike scott bossman eric peterson you know bearland Ireland, you know genie you know the team or whatever it is like, it's just, I'm so grateful for it because I can tell you how that happens. <laughs> like, how, how did I get lucky like that? But um, I think it's one of those things where if you, if you do something long enough, um, 
that that you know what's that that phrase like um luck is when opportunity meets uh when preparedness meets opportunity so i was prepared for it i recognized it and i'm like tate boom and and you know off we go and tate how long have we been doing this now it's been like it's like it seems like yesterday four Four years years. oh it's nuts yeah i mean a long time still not bored of each other still not tired of each other no and that's the great thing is like when we when we see each other at boot camp it's like it's such it's it's such a breath of fresh air it's like so nice to get together again and see each other and it's hard work but you know we all enjoy each other i think and even Jeannie will tell you like she comes on a podcast like we all genuinely enjoy each other yes you do and you you feel it when you go to boot camp so as soon as we walked in you know i'm partnering with my husband but he works full time and and so it's really hard so i have to, i'm doing most of it but as soon as he walked in, he could feel the positive energy that all of you gave off. And he, we went on a break and he said, that's, that's the group that I want to be part of. Yeah, that's, that's really, that's really special. So I think that's sort of the, uh, a good segue to go into the next topic because we're just not going to beat that Kurt Richter's uh, or Kurt Morham story, um, which is the case study um, that, Scott Todd is going to share. So today, Mark, today we actually uh, had a sale and I was kind of chuckling about it because um, it's funny how uh, essentially, you know, the the numbers tend to line up sometimes. So here's a property. We paid $4,000 for the property and we sold it for on terms for, for 19,000. So what? almost five X, right. You know, almost a 500% kind of return there and it's uh, paid over five years. Okay. So it's a 60 month note. And again, we paid 4,000 for it. We were asking for uh, eight. Uh, let's see. We're asking for a thousand dollars down. And when the guy called up and uh, was asking about it, we said, Hey, listen, we will sell it to you. How much do you want to put down? And he said, well, can I do a thousand? We're like, sure, but could you do more? Because if you can do more, then we can get the payments lower, the time frame lowered. And he said, yeah, I can do 1500. So we collected a 1500 down payment today, plus our doc fee, so 1749. And remember though, we we're only into this thing for $4,000. So now after I got my money back, I'm $2,500 into this thing. He's paying 300 a month for the next 60 months. Not bad. And my annual return, the, the number that I think is more important than just the, you know, the, the normal return, the annual return is like 140% a year. Like I can't get 140% anywhere else. But it does beg the question of, you know, like people want to get higher down payments. I want a higher down payment. But the challenge here is that you can't always go after what you want. You have to go after what the market will bear unless what, unless you want to sell on this property for a while, because you could find a buyer. I could have asked for $5,000 down or $4,000. I could have been out of it, but I probably would have sat on that property for three, four, five months waiting for that one person to come. Why would I do that? Why would I not just get it sold get as much as I can and move on. But that's kind of a challenge. I think we see people see, right? Yeah. Tate, what's your takeaway? You know, I, I think it's perfect. I think Scott nailed it. I had a deal recently where the numbers that I was asking for were significantly higher than every other comp in the area. And so the guy got on the phone with me and said, well, you know, I'd like working with you. I'd want, I want to do business with you, but you guys are charging 30% more. How come? And I, you know, I explained to him that, Hey, you're working with me and, and that's worth something, right? No, I'm kidding. But, uh, uh, we ended up going back and forth a little bit and he beat me up on that price. a little. And I did not sell the property for what I had hoped for, but the truth is I sold it for what it was worth. I sold it for what the market demanded. And Although I would have loved to get all of my money out in the first 12 months, it's looking like it's going to be a 15 month deal. It doesn't mean it's a bad deal or anything like that because the the return's still there, but sometimes we don't have control over this. And 
the larger your down payment, the fewer number of people that are going to be willing to buy the property from you, right? Uh, the higher you go up, inevitably, the smaller the buyer pool. So you have to keep that in mind when, when you're buying your properties. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jeannie, what's your takeaway? I love it. I'm not, I'm not on terms yet. I sell my, my property for cash right now, but I totally agree with both of them. You know, because if, if I was a buyer, if you're expecting me to pay 1500 versus 1000 if I can't pay the $1,500, i will i will pay you the 1000 So give me that opportunity to do it and I'll buy it. But I won't. I won't do it for fifteen hundred. So I, I totally agree with them. You you have to go with the market and what people are willing to pay. But you're still you're still making a profit. No, absolutely. And I, I do think that you you could have sort of this mindset that you've got to get these low down payments, which can can actually pigeon you pigeonhole you into never getting a big down payment, and then you can be on the opposite end of the spectrum where because of what your financial situation is, you're insisting that the market bend to your will somehow and you get a big down payment. And I think the reality is there needs to be flexibility. Like I always tell people, I'm flexible like a yogi. I'll do whatever it takes to get that deal. Now, would I like a larger down payment? Absolutely. Will we negotiate like Scott Todd to get a larger down payment? Absolutely. But do I insist on it? No. Tate, Mark. Mark, if you have to have a big down payment, are you buying the right properties? Like if, Probably if, not. If you, Probably can't, not. If, you can, if you have to have a $2,000 down payment on a $4,000 acquisition, because without it, your business is dead in the water, are you buying the right properties? I'm probably not. It's not that I'm not buying the right properties. I'm probably not capitalized well enough is what it is. Yeah, it's, I, mean, I have a capital issue. Which we can solve, obviously, right? You can go in, right. sell your notes. There's other ways to do it. But if buying one property uses up all of your capital, then I don't know if that was the right property to buy right away. I think you need to organically grow into the more expensive properties, right? Everybody wants to start off hunting after those $500 a month down pay or $500 a month payments. But in reality, everybody needs to start at the $50 and the $100 ones because that's where you're able to grow and you're able to predict it and, and everything. At least that's my opinion on it. Jeannie? I couldn't agree with Tate better, more because that's what I've been doing. And I've been doing the, the you know, less expensive properties. And what Mike has been teaching me is go quickly, go, you know, go through the process. So you learn the process. So I've been buying properties very reasonably and flipping them at a very good price. So, and that's why I'm at, I'm just doing the cash process right now. And I'm building the, I'm building the business. I couldn't agree with him more. And that's when you, you're going to feel more successful and you're going to keep going because you're giving, you're building traction. So I, I agree. I totally agree with Tate. Yeah. Scott Todd. Well, there's a thing and maybe I, maybe I should write a book, Mark, like, you know, maybe I should write a book about <laughs> many topics, but maybe this is one of them, but I do believe in the art of the first deal, right? Like there's, there's something that happens when you've done a deal and I don't care if you feel like it's the ugliest deal ever. The, the fact that you went off and sold a piece of land and you went full cycle on it, all of a sudden it's like, it's like you realize like, boom, I can do this. All of a sudden you start to see like, holy cow, people will pay me because what it, what happens is, I think we get into a, a lot of, um, what am I trying to say? I think we put ourselves in, in the buyer's shoes a lot of times. We assume that they won't pay $99 or we assume they won't pay this amount of money because maybe we wouldn't pay that amount of money, right? Or we think like, oh, someone doesn't have $15,000 cash laying around for a property. We don't know what they have, okay? So what we have to do is we have to just do a deal. The minute that we do a deal, our confidence level rises. We start like walking like we've never walked before. We're happier. As Mark would tell me, like the day I walked out on my corporate job, the sky is bluer. The foods taste better. The minute that you do that deal, all the other things go away. All the self-doubt, all the pressure you put on yourself goes away. My first few deals, $99, $99 down, $99 a month. Okay. 
I remember a, a land geeker came up to me at the very first boot camp that I was at. And, and I was, he's like, how, what'd you do on your first deal? I'm like, $99 down, $99 a month. He's like, how much did you pay for the property? I said, $4,000. He said, you realize it's going to be 39 months before you get your money back? And I'm like, yep, I know that. But I also knew me, if I could get some traction and get going and start running, start jogging, okay, then I could start running. But if I never got off the, off the, off the ground because I had a lot of self-doubt, well, then I would be doing ATM investing right now. Yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of getting off the ground and, dare I say, flying, flight school for June is coming up before you know it. And if you want to learn how to execute in real time with Obi-Wan himself, Scott Todd and the mini bat, then just go to the landgeek.com forward slash training, schedule a call with Mike Zane or Scott Bossman, and they will give you the rundown of how your life is about to change with flight school. Jeannie Morm, is it, is it too much hyperbole to say it's life changing to go to flight school? Oh, it is life changing. I, just what Scott said was life changing. I'm 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 here shaking my head, wanting to jump and do cartwheels because Scott is absolutely right. And it doesn't matter as long as you make a profit, just keep going. And that de- just that first deal, as he's describing it, I'm feeling it. I'm getting so excited that I, it wasn't that long ago that I sold my first you know property, and I get I get so excited listening to him. But also, I was thinking the other day, I was in the mall here in Scottsdale. And I know it's, there's, there's money there. And I, when you put it in perspective, I saw women buying $500 purses. I have sold land for $500. So you never ever want to assume that someone's not going to pay that price for your property because they're buying $500 purses, which I think is, I mean, not, not a very smart business deal on my perspective, go buy land instead of a purse. And so, um, yeah, you, you can't assume that someone's not going to pay that price for your property. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to buy a $500 purse, well, get yourself five notes at 99 bucks a month, right? And have that person have that, have that tranche of notes pay for purse every single month. Yes. That's what you want. Right. Then your, then your purse would only cost you $125. Yeah. (laughs) You invest $125 and the next thing you know, boom, you got, you got people sending you money. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, Tate and I always are joking. Like we don't pay for anything. Our borrowers pay for everything. And, um, and that's how you can structure your life. If that's, if you want, you know, things or you want to go do experience things and, you know, be like Tate and jet set around the world, have someone finance it for you. Sell some land, own or finance it. It, it starts off slowly and then it builds. So, um, I, I definitely encourage everyone listening to this that haven't, that hasn't gone to flight school, um, to, to definitely learn more about that because that execution in real time, the accountability, the knowledge includes a toolkit. You get everything. Um, it's like, uh, a land geek in a box and, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anything better. Um, and then you graduate from that and you get Tate for one-on-one coaching. So you know, it all starts there. Um, for my tip of the week, because Eric and, and Mike aren't on, my tip of the week is, I don't know if you guys know this or Janie know this, May 28th, Dirt Rich is officially launching. So if you want to get on the list to get literally like thousands of dollars of bonuses with the book, just go to thelandgeek.com forward slash dirt dash rich. Um, put in your email, download for free the first chapter, and then we'll start, you know, letting you know when the launch is happening and how you can get those bonuses. So I'm very excited about it. Um, so far, so good. Like the, the reviews have been, have been pretty good. Um, Jeannie, have you read it yet? No, but I was going to ask you, um, we can get it on Kindle right now for 99 cents. Can we do that now or not? Not yet. Not yet. It hasn't officially launched yet, but it, it Okay. We're, we're gonna we're gonna work on it. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, what I like, you know what I like to do? Um, maybe our listening audience likes it too. I like to get the Kindle version and the hard copy version. I like to get both of them um, because sometimes you can't get um, reception if you're using like your your um, iPad or something. So it's nice to have a hard copy too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Scott Todd, are we good? 
We're good, Mark. All right, Tate. Yep. It was a really, Tate? really good call. All right, fantastic. Well, I want to thank all the listeners and yeah, I hope everybody's getting value. Please, please support the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of the review to support at thelandgeek.com. We are going to send you for free the passive income launch kit course, which is normally $97. So please do that. And uh, are we ready? Are we doing this? Let's do it, Mark. One. Now that Bearland's not, not on, it should be pretty smooth. Should nail it. Yeah. One, two, three. Let, Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Not bad. Boom. We did it. We did it. We did it. You know, Bearland's uh, with Missy right now. Happy birthday, Missy. Um, and uh, riding the buggy to town. Riding the buggy to town. And hopefully, Bearland Aaron is spoiling Bearland Missy. It's all good. It's all good. So, um, Jeannie, what's, what's for lunch today? Nothing, nothing exciting. Just leftover chicken. Now, I got to pick up my daughter at two, so I got to do something relatively quick. I can't do one of my long, leisurely Tate Litchfield type lunches where, you know, <laughs> I had a I, long I cycle and I had a long, leisurely brunch today. It was, I rode my bike, met Allison and the baby at uh, one of her favorite breakfast stops, had a nice lunch or had a nice breakfast, enjoyed the sun, the cool weather, came oh. home. Worked a little bit, and now I'm here on the podcast. So, how good is that? That's a great Tuesday morning. Most people, man. Mark Mark makes me like work during my lunch hour. That's crazy. <laughs> makes you? Yeah, we had, we're we're getting we're getting like free mentorship from these guests. True, true that. True. You know, it's fun. we had a lot of fun today. Yeah, it was fun. Whatever. <laughs> Chuckles, good chuckles today, man. Good, good chuckles, good chuckles. So you know, you know what you do in the uh, the Facebook group, uh, the mastermind and the official uh, mastermind group and the VIP group. We should pose the question: What is your perfect day? Like when you wake up to the time you go to bed, what does your perfect day look like, and how can you make that a reality? Because I, I think a lot of times we have great days, but we're like, was it a perfect day? Like, what would that actually look like? That's a good I mean, question. Keep it, I guess. I mean, you know, we have to keep it G-rated. I know what Jeannie's thinking, but <laughs> you know. oh good, darn! <laughs> good, good God, great sex podcast. So you know, we just all assume by the end of the morning, great sex is included in your <laughs> your perfect day. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm blushing. Me too. I'm blushing. Oh, yeah. I've got nothing to say to that. <laughs> and that's how we end today, Mark. And that's, and that's how we end. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for jumping on. Thanks. All right. See you next week.